Welcome back everybody. This is Eric and Chad here with Iraq Veteran 8888. Today we've got another firearms fact episode for you and we're going to be talking about organizing your suppressor components. And what I mean by that is muzzle devices, tools, threat protectors, and we're going to go into some other details in this video. Don't leave. It's very important that you guys know if you're a suppressor owner, you need to watch this video. Uh, I definitely want to take a quick moment here to thank the folks at Sonoran Desert Institute for allowing videos like this to keep going for us. Uh, they're a great online gunsmithing school. They have some great programs. If you're wanting to learn more about this type of stuff in more detail, they're a great resource to go through. If you have unused GI Bill, they're also a great source for that. Um, they can really hook you up in terms of their programs. And if you got GI Bill, it's a great way to use that. Um, so let's talk about it a little bit more here. Um, th this video sort of stemmed from a conversation between Chad and I the <laughs> other day. Chad is uber organized when it comes to his suppressor uh, parts and everything like that. And whereby on the other side of the coin, I'm extremely unorganized. I've just got like a little yellow tray inside of my safe with a whole bunch of random crap with no rhyme or reason. And because I don't really change around this stuff very often, I don't really have to disassemble them very often. And, and I'll be quite honest with you guys. I'm a gun guy tried and true. Y'all know that from all these years of you know, watching our videos. But suppressors intimidate me. And and I don't mean in terms you know their physical use. I love suppressors, of course, they, but they but they intimidate me in the in terms of sometimes you know they can be complex. Mm -hmm. I mean each one is a slightly different design. They all require their own like specific tools, and they require their own specific disassembly procedures and care procedures, which I completely ignore. <laughs> uh, so let's go into this a little bit. You know, you're talking about a guy over here who uh, tried to put a rugged surge on a uh, dead air break one day. It was like. What am I doing wrong? <laughs> but um, it's confusing when, when you when you become a suppressor owner. I mean, obviously this video isn't geared toward everybody, but you know those of you who might own a couple of cans or you might own ten or fifteen cans or whatever. You know, you wind up having multiple parts laying around, like Eric said, muzzle devices, mounting systems, um, direct thread adapters, all kinds of things, thread protectors, the whole nine yards. Look at all and this. The thing is, if you if you're a very detail-oriented person, you kind of know which parts go with what particular suppressor. And uh, what we're also going to discuss in this video, too, is what is actually considered a suppressor part, which is something that you can't technically leave outside of your you know, secure location. Uh, for example, I mean, I'll go ahead and just mention it. This is a uh, surge uh, adapt module is what they call it. And this actually adds a, um, I believe it's just two baffles. Yeah, this adds a, another little uh, extension here onto the end of the surge so you can go from like a K size or like more like an S size to an L size and you pay you take the end cap off drop it on the adapt module and then thread this in this is technically a suppressor so this is treated as a suppressor by the ATF so you can't just leave this in a box and leave it outside of your safe it has to be properly stored just like the suppressor does uh, any baffle any wipe Nowadays, used to, Dead Air had the ghost suppressor that had the small wipe in the front of it and made it super quiet. And ATF came back after several years of saying the wipes were not considered suppressor parts and kind of redacted that. And that now, if you wear out a wipe mm -hmm. after 30 or 40 shots, you have to send your suppressor back to the manufacturer to get the wipe changed. So, I mean, um, just to clarify for the <clears throat> folks that are watching this video that may not know what a wipe is, explain oh, yeah, yeah. what a wipe is. So, a wipe is... Uh, a wipe is basically a, a piece of like neoprene or rubber, you know, a uh, very dense piece of rubber that's in a disc form, kind of like a washer. And it'll have either a small port through the center of it or it'll have like kind of a, a slit. And uh, it basically is used to trap gas inside of the suppressor itself and allow the bullet to pass through. And it really helps with uh, SPL's uh, sound pressure level. So it'll definitely make the suppressor quieter. A lot of the old school Mac cans had a series of wipes in them. Some suppressors were consisting nothing or of nothing but wipes and um, very quiet cans, but they didn't last. So nothing, to, nothing more than really just an overglorified yeah. O-ring. Yeah, pretty much. You'd have to rebuild the can after a couple of magazines for the most part. But yeah. um, as far as organizing your components go, uh, a friend of mine kind of turned me on to little Plano cases. I had all my stuff just kind of tucked away in drawers and things like that. But these Plano cases work really well because you can divide them up. And I mean, I literally just went to Walmart and bought these for like $2. 
but in, in this one here we have various uh, adapters for the Griffin armament, uh, 9mm 45 cans, the uh, Silencer Co. Uh, pistol cans, we've got some dead air adapters, we've got some Liberty uh, Nielsen devices, and I also have some extra pistons in here for pistol cans, uh, various brands. Uh, three lug adapters for the Liberty cans, direct thread adapters for the Liberty cans, OSS adapters, a whole piston assembly there, some disassembly tools, three lug adapter, I mean, 22 spacer, all kinds of stuff. You know, chemo, I mean, but this is a way for you to just keep all your non-suppressor part parts organized and at the ready. If, you know, you're especially like us, we're doing a lot of testing on different cans all the time and I'm always swapping especially cans that have ASR threading in the rear that are very, very versatile. Um, you know, swapping these around between different hosts, uh, testing different muzzle devices, uh, whether or not something's quieter with a direct thread or a brake or a flash hider, you know, with the extra blast area that you might get with a chemo adapter, or if the ASR is quieter, whatever the case is. It just gives us options to be able to test things with, but having everything right here at the ready makes it easy just to pull it out, see what I need, and then boom, there it is, it's done. You know, not to not to change the subject, but sort of something that's in line with the same subject. Uh, when, when he mentions the older suppressors, you look at the old Psyonix cans are on the uh, you know uh, Mac tens and stuff. Mm -hmm. It's basically just a giant can, and when you pull it apart to service it, they're literally it's like boot grommets mm -hmm. that it's just full of these grommets, right? So when you start talking about oh well, what's a suppressor component? Well, I mean you can buy boot grommets. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, all of these people start to, to, to he and haw over every little thing in terms of this. Now, like that right there, I mean, it came off my suppressor. Mm -hmm. So, clarify, I suppose, or, or I guess I'm, I, I just did a Yoda moment. Clarify, we will. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, we should clarify that um, as a, a component that is considered part of your suppressor is something that's literally part of the suppressor like this section that physically came off the suppressor and just to be clear and, and and people may not know this you can just you can call up and buy a mount from anybody mm -hmm. like this this muzzle device right here can you get out of there no i fail at life <laughs> all right so like this mount you know you can you can go on any any old website wherever and just buy a mount for a mm -hmm. suppressor that and this one happens to double as a brake mm -hmm. so some of these mounts will double as a muzzle brake mm -hmm. Some of them will only double as a flash hider, and both of those things have advantages and disadvantages as well, which we'll talk about in a minute. But even something like this adapter, you would look at that and think, well, that screws into the rear of a suppressor. That, that has to be a suppressor part. Nope. It's not. It's a mount. A mounting system or muzzle device is not a suppressor part, um, but this is. Yeah, because <laughs> it's, it's literally baffles. Um, right. The end caps, a lot of uh, modern suppressors have replaceable end caps. There'll be like a 30 cal bore or 45 bore, whatever the case is, and you can replace the end caps to help quiet them down just a little bit when shooting subcalibers through it. Those are not considered suppressor parts. Now, unlike the AAC cans, like the M4 2000, SDN6, Mini 4, those type of suppressors, uh, they have a uh, latch in the rear that's part of the mounting system. It's a small latch, it's got a, like a, a little just spring up under it, and it has like two or three little teeth and it engages with the 512 flash hider. That tiny little latch is a suppressor part. You can't just call up AAC when it wears out and say, hey, I need to order a few latches just in case I break them uh, or they wear out. Uh, yeah, no, you gotta send the can in to have that latch replaced because the latch is considered a suppressor part. Let me tell you something dumb about that as well. Look, I really like the SDN6. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is a great suppressor. It sounds good on a lot of my different, you know, guns that I use. And the SDN6 was my first 30 cal suppressor that I owned, mm -hmm. the Same 51 here. tooth adapter. Uh, they're heavy, but they're rugged. Mm -hmm. They sound great. They hold up really great. The mounting system is a little weird though, because it's like, you'll find that if I take a uh, an SDN6 and I take five different 51 tooth adapters, mm -hmm. all right, his rifle, my rifle, various rifles, whatever, but five different adapters, on some of those adapters, it might screw around really tight and it kind of makes that, that last little tiny bit of a turn and that tooth, those teeth lock in there really tight and it doesn't move at all. Mm -hmm. And some of them, it's like no matter how tight, tight you get it, there's like a little bit of wobble mm -hmm. in play. I don't like that mounting system. It's just... Um it, but it is handy. It's just the tolerances, you know, from the factory with the latches and then also the, the mounting system itself, uh, placement of the teeth, the whole nine yards. I mean, everything's got a little bit of tolerance to it, but 
uh, I would take those mounts and put them on the lathe and then just turn the taper back just a tiny bit. Just to, to get it to snug down. Yeah, just to basically make like a custom mounting option for a particular host with a particular suppressor. So they can be, you know, just they, kind of finely tuned tweaked. a little bit. Um, you know, Silencer Co. went to like, a, I think a 90, 90 tooth or so, and AAC also went to like a 90 tooth setup as well. That way you had more teeth in there to get that suppressor nice and snug before it locked in place. So it kind of mitigated that whole locking up problem that those early cans had. But um, this particular little section is a, a piece off a of KG made swarm suppressor. Well, actually, elevated silence swarm. Um, but this is just a small modular section that goes on the front of the can, and it has all the little baffles in there and adds like four extra baffles. This is a suppressor part. The baffles are suppressor parts. The uh, tube, tube is a suppressor part. The end cap is not, as we discussed. Uh, the rear caps are typically not, as we discussed as well. But these have to be stored in, in you know, safe. And usually I keep these things just in my safe unless I need to go to the range or something and I'm taking all these components with me. But um, the main thing is just showing how to kind of store them. And this is just one option. I mean, some people have such a huge collection of suppressors, just a couple of Plano cases may not work. You might have to have a toolbox with everything that you might own. And this is just the extra stuff that's not even in use right now. I've got mounts on various cans, like the Trilug here. This is actually a Griffin Armament Trilug, but it's the same thread pitch for the Omega 9K from Silencer Co. And it's a low profile Trilug adapter, and that thing pretty much just lives on that can. And then various Liberty adapters, like I mentioned, yep. the like the Mystic X and the Cosmic and the Centurion, they're very, very versatile suppressors and they can be used on a wide variety of different host firearms. So therefore you have a bunch of different mounting options for them. And the mounting options are pretty much near endless. All right, so that's a great way to segue into the next part of this video. So, you know, we talked a little bit about organizing your stuff and how important that is. So why is there so much stuff? So let's talk about that a little bit. So when you think about standardization of a certain product, right? Like, okay, Silencer Co. is offering, you know, basically doing that kind of standardized thread pitch that they use. Mm -hmm. ASR. The ASR thread pitch that they use or whatever. And that's smart. But, okay, let's think about something like muzzle devices, right? So there's all these different thread pitches that these muzzle devices come in at. But I think it's safe to say that, all right, if you have an AR or if you have a uh, 30 cal, uh, bolt gun or a 30 cal uh, auto load or whatever, you know, your 30 cal is going to be a 5 8 by 24. That's considered standard. And then on your 22 bores, most of them are going to be half by 28. Mm -hmm. So there is a little bit of standardization in terms of threads on the rear of the suppressor, but then you get uh, start getting all these different mounting solutions and everything like that. Um, I think one of my personal gripes, and this isn't gun gripe, but <laughs> one of my gripes about it is that it seems like if you find a couple of suppressors you like, let's just say one happens to be like, one of my favorite nine millimeter suppressors is the Omega 9K, because it sounds great on a ton of different platforms. But man, it's like, okay, so to go on the MP5 or on a Scorpion or whatever, you have to get a Trilug or run it, you know what I mean? You, you gotta have a Trilug to run it on, on Trilugs. Then you have to have booster assemblies for different handguns. And it's just all this rigmarole. I'll see. And you wind up, you know, zoning in on a suppressor you like. So you're you're stuck with the with the quandary of having to. All right. So do I just buy a ton of different um, suppressors and then have to deal with all this? Now we yeah. do. The, we we have a lot of different stuff because we have to test a lot of different mm -hmm. stuff. But average, you know, Joe Blow who just wants to invest in a suppressor. So what happens? Do you buy? this one and go, wow, I really like this can, and then go buy four more or however mm -hmm. many you need. I mean, like in my case, I've bought uh, additional AAC products like the SDN6 and M4 2000 simply because I've already invested in 500 bucks worth of mounts. Uh, the, mount, the mounts are expensive in a lot of cases. I mean, most of the time for a suppressor mount, you're going to pay over $80. You know, and that's kind of on the low end. Um, but uh, if you you know if you run in something like the Omega 9K with a tri lug or any particular can with a tri lug and it can handle like 300 blackout or whatever, they do make uh, 5 8 by 24 to tri lug adapters. So this further increases the versatility of a particular suppressor with one particular mounting option in it. Um, my my personal opinion these days, just after after being in the game for a while and just you know playing with so much different stuff, is I, I wish that I would have started with just direct thread. But you know the whole thing is, you get 
a particular can that's QD, okay, I've got four or five different rifles that I want to be able to run that particular 30 caliber suppressor on. So you buy five mounts and you can swap it between the, the rifles. But then come to find out, like, when you pull the can off and put it back on, you get a very m minuscule point of impact shift each time you do that. Um, you know, because sometimes you get some carbon buildup in the suppressor and it, you get it zeroed just right and you break that carbon loose and then it kind of changes the harmonics a little bit. So direct threads, you don't have to worry about that as much. You still get a tiny bit of point of impact shift, but there's no additional mounting systems to have to worry about. You just drop the can on there and go. And that's one reason why I really like the ASR uh, rear thread pitch nowadays because a lot of companies are going to that just because that, that particular mounting system that Silencer Co. you know dreamed up a while back is very very popular, and you know you can get uh, ASR mounting systems for Yankee Hill devices. You can get them for Dead Air devices. You can mm -hmm. get them for the Silencer Co. devices. Obviously, um, there are some uh, modules I believe that adapt down to like the 51 tooth AAC stuff using kind of like the old school like Mad mounts and everything. Uh, I Wasn't mean, Yankee Hill the one that was offering that one suppressor? It had like the all turbo. the different mounts. Yeah. Yeah, they, in it. man, Yankee Hill's got that turbo, and I haven't been able to try those cans out, but they're super inexpensive, and for for what you pay, you get all the mounting. Yeah, that they you give just you a bunch of need. mounts with it. Direct thread, uh, you know, QD style, some various uh, end caps, you know, with a, a brake system on the front of it or a flat cap, all kinds of stuff that would cost extra in a lot of other systems. All right, so, so. here's another really good uh, talking point that's related to what Chad was just talking about, and that's tolerance stacking. Mm. Um, we actually ran into a very similar issue with this Galil Ace right here. So uh, we pulled the factory device off, and we went to put our... Um, that's that's a dead air. That's a rugged. A rugged. rugged. I, I'm so crappy with silencer <laughs> names, guys. I'd really, yeah, that's a, uh, that's rugged. a rug, rugged uh, surge. Mm -hmm. Seven six two surge. Uh, we went to put the muzzle device on, and we used our Geisley suppressor alignment rod, which I feel in the vein of this video is a necessity. You, you need to own at least a thirty and twenty two caliber suppressor mm -hmm. alignment rod. Buy them. They're not that expensive. They're precision made. Geisley does a great job with mm -hmm. those. Get the Geisley suppressor alignment rods and check that bore alignment. When you get into tolerance stacking, that's when you start getting into, okay, well, this barrel had to be indicated in the lathe and turned, right? And then at some point it had to be threaded. Well, are the threads, you know, concentric to the bore? I mean, all of those tolerances matter. And every gun might have a slight amount of, you know what I mean, tolerance issue. Mm -hmm. You know, now a real super precision made barrel like if you buy a Krieger or Bartling barrel mm -hmm. or any of the higher end barrels, and let's, most of your fancy match grade stuff isn't threaded anyway, right? Usually. Well, I mean, a lot of times you can order the barrels and have but, them threaded from the factory. But yeah. if you order a Krieger that's threaded, it's gonna be legit. Yeah. You know, it's gonna be right. You know what I mean? Every because mm -hmm. those those barrels are very very precise. Now something like this Galil Ace, I mean, this sucker's way off, and we were worried because that suppressor alignment rod was real low. Now, okay, if you go with a direct thread option versus having a mount, well, what are you now doing? You're mm -hmm. eliminating a, a bit of potential tolerance stacking mm -hmm. because the more things you thread on there that have to cope, that, that have to line up mm -hmm. and have to be concentric to the bore, the more chances you have of some machining tolerance being slightly off and making that already wrong relationship between the center of the bore and the axis of the barrel stock even more mm -hmm. Untrue. Well, the big problem with the, the Ace and some similar uh, rifles, including like the SCAR uh, 17 and even the SCAR 20, really, the barrels are pretty thin at the threads. Um, so they don't really have a definitive, you know, 90 degree shoulder or even like a, a tapered shoulder or anything like that that you could actually run like some of the Q devices and stuff or like they've got a 20 degree taper or something like that inside of them um, and they taper onto a legitimate taper that's cut into the barrel. I've seen that done you know, on, on a custom basis sometimes too, but most of your common barrels are gonna have a 90 degree shoulder in the rear. And on these skinny barrels, unless they have uh, a shoulder that's kind of machined into the barrel, it's really thin and then it widens out and then you got a 90 degree shoulder, you don't yep. really have anything to go up against except muzzle. Now, on, in the case of this rugged device, we wound up running it all the way down and letting the muzzle bottom out inside the uh, muzzle device. Now, as far as the concentricity goes of the muzzle device, that's where you start tolerance stacking. So you're adding 
another level of tolerance that has to be met. And then you're putting the suppressor on there, which if the can isn't like EDM, wire EDM down the bore, and the baffles are maybe just a little bit off kilter, then you're gonna run into some problems there as well. And that just adds another variable in the mix. But, you know, if if this can was longer and and that concentricity was a little bit more off, then, you know, if if somebody would have just gone out and mounted it up and shot it, they probably would have had a baffle strike at the end baffle. Potentially, um, yes. That's where cans like the Dead Air Wolverine come into play because they have kind of a, a conical bore that widens as you get toward the end of the suppressor because they're meant to go on com block weapons. Which with, traditionally are or, not exactly the most precisely <laughs> threaded. I mean, <laughs> you um, know, you thread it on there and then it might be a little bit off, but you're widening out as you get toward the end of the can. Those anyway, cans so are loud. They are a little bit loud for sure, but they, they're good for their intended application. But um, <clears throat> with these type of systems, you really have to, you know, you really have to just butt that muzzle device up against the, the muzzle threads, just like on an M1A. It's the same way. Little pencil barrel, threads yep. are right up against it. It's just so many things. If man. you want to see an example <clears throat> of what he's talking about with the barrel being stepped out, there are some factory guns that do that. If you look at the Micro 7 actions from mm -hmm. Remington and like 300 Blackout, yep. they have a little nub, nub on the end because the barrels are so skinny that you can't thread it 5.8 by 24. You have to have some physical meat left on the um, barrel in terms the, of how it's turned down. Uh, the M10X also has that, that right. set up as well. You know, right. give you a good shoulder to just butt yeah, it. Yeah, and I, I feel like that's a much better option. You know, you should have a good shoulder, you know, on there. Well, so. it's the shoulders are machined into the barrel just the same time the threads are done most of the time. Uh, like Eric mentioned on the, on the really premium barrels, those things are set up in four jaw lays and everything, and they're dialed out. They're indicated to within literally tenths of ten thousandths of an inch a lot of times. Um, and when they're turned, they are perfectly concentric. I mean, I almost wonder, you know, and here, here, this is just me talking because of the way that the mount on this Galil Ace is butted, butted up against the physical crown of, of the muzzle. Mm. I would almost wonder if instead of the threads being non-concentric to the bore, if the muzzle's off. It could be. You know? So see, that's another thing you talk about with tolerance yeah. stacking. You have to consider these things. Um, a suppressor's nothing more than a muzzle device, guys. Don't don't let it be this big snake oil thing. You know, they're, they're covered under the NFA. You have to register them. It's bull crap that you have to register them. We could go into a whole nother video about how it's wrong to even require these things to be registered in the first place because they're so common mm -hmm. use and they do protect your hearing. Mm -hmm. Uh, they're much nicer to other people in your area when you're shooting. Mm -hmm. Also, when you're out hunting, you're not making as much noise and scaring nearby game mm -hmm. or waking up the neighbors early in the morning with like a you know hunting rifle shot. So <gasps> suppressors have a ton of common use uh, place in everyday society with firearms. Um, man, it just... I just prefer to shoot suppressed. I mean, who doesn't want to not have to wear ear pro as often, or uh, who wants to who wants to be in a situation where they know that they can do the same shooting and not necessarily disturb the neighbors as badly? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I feel like uh, shooting suppressed is, is a nice gesture mm -hmm. to the people around you, especially if you live in a somewhat populated area where uh, there's a lot of gunfire going on. Maybe you live far enough out of the out of the city where you can shoot in your yard but you might still have some neighbors that are within hearing distance. So suppressors are a nice way to, uh, you know, kind of keep the peace a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, which is definitely not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything else you want to go over in this video? Uh, other than that, I mean, other than organizing your suppressor parts themselves, I mean, just keeping a few tools handy. Like if you're going to the range or whatever, and you're going to be testing a particular can out on a bunch of different host weapons just to play around with this, your brand new can or whatever, just make sure you got your tools and stuff with you. I mean, I usually just keep the uh, various tools for various suppressor parts and, and such as that in my range bags in the truck all the time. I mean, an adjustable wrench, strap a wrench. strap wrench, you know, some sort of like rag or whatever, or some, some gloves to be able to handle hot suppressors or like a Coltac like you know, Vulcan pouch or whatever. Uh, C-clip -cl pliers work really well. Uh, spanner wrenches. I mean, all that kind of stuff. Just yep. anything that you might need needs to go in a range bag and stay there and go with you wherever you go because you're going to wind up in some situation like we have where I've needed a strap wrench and I haven't had one and we're like trying to get a mount off a suppressor and we're both just... Yeah, <laughs> you know? or, or trying to get the suppressor off, period. And it's just, yeah. you know, carbon build Dude, up once they get hot, I mean, everything starts to kind of expand a little bit. And But uh, anyways, you know, the, the Plano cases are a very, very cheap way. Uh, to organize your parts and you could even go one step further and keep everything in the same exact bay and label them and all that. I'm not quite that organized. 
But, but you, you can be if you need to. Yeah, but if I need something, I know where it is at any given time and I don't have to go hunt for it. So. Another important accessory, and I'll just end the video on this note real quick. I want to give a shout out to Justin at Coltac. Look, um, I think... Dustin, I'm sorry. I'm so bad. With, look, I, I don't know suppressor names or people's names. I don't know names, period. So anyway, Dustin's a good dude over there at Coltac, and uh, that mirage is also a big deal. I think suppressor wraps in terms of, you know, physically covering your suppressor is also important because the suppressor wrap can keep the suppressor itself from getting damaged. Mm -hmm. It can help with mitigating the mirage and because of the way that they're made, can make them a little bit safer to handle if they get hot. If you do need to remove it or whatever, <laughs> that suppressor wrap can also help keep you from getting burned. The first time you touch a hot can to your leg and you burn off some hair, you're gonna you're gonna really want one. Yes. So <laughs> so, so check out Coltac. They've got a lot of great um, you know accessories for suppressors yeah. that I, I feel are pretty important to have. Almost a necessity in the big scheme of things. That's but. right. Um, guys, thank you for watching today's video. We hope you enjoyed it, maybe learned something. Uh, we're really just doing this video to try to help people. So if you're new to suppressors or maybe you own 30 suppressors, uh, maybe this video helped you, gave you some food for thought. Uh, definitely want to take a moment to thank all our Patreon supporters. Thank you guys so very much for supporting our channel. Uh, those of you who purchased man cans to support the channel, thank you guys so very much for your support. And uh, those of you who purchase t-shirts, like the one he's wearing here, over on our website or other merchandise, all of those funds that we earn go directly back into supporting the channel, directly back into making this content. So thank you guys so very much for seeing value in what we do and supporting us. It means a lot to me and my family. Have a great day. We'll see you next time. See you guys.